Well, have we got a deal for you today? Who doesn't like a two-for-one sale, right? Well, in all honesty, we have a bit of a homily in two parts today. So Father Satish asked me to offer a brief, what I hope is kind of a short reflection on the readings. Uh, and then Father Satish, our pastor, uh, would like to just say a few words about some ministry opportunities uh, that, is, that are upcoming, that are happening here in the parish. So I get to go first. Several years ago, when we were still traveling for fun, uh, I was able to go to Barcelona in Spain for a few days. And one of the places that I visited was the Basilica de la Sagrada Familia, the Basilica of the Holy Family. It is a huge, beautiful, architecturally remarkable church that really just rises up as if it is rising to heaven uh, from the middle of the city. Now what's interesting about Sagrada Familia is by European standards, it's pretty young. The church's construction only began in 1882. The cathedral in Barcelona dates to the 1400s, by the way. And while it was started in 1882, the church is still under construction. The last estimate I found was that it should be completed in the year 2026. And that year will be the 100th anniversary of the death of its main architect. And for the mathematicians out there, that'll be 144 years after it was first begun to be constructed. I mention all of this because I hope that it makes Jesus' statement in the gospel today all that more incredible. In response to the crowd's desire for a sign, Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Of course, the crowd is left scratching their heads. Because temples and churches, they are not just built in three days. These th things take time. We hear in the gospel that the temple has been under construction for 46 years and it still wasn't completed. And in the gospel of John, right before we have this episode, Jesus has just turned water into wine. But for the people, this statement seemed way crazier. How could he build a temple in just three days? But of course we know that this statement, it's not about the construction skills of this carpenter from Nazareth. But Jesus is very much more speaking of himself. Now for the Jews in ancient Israel, the temple in Jerusalem was their most important place. Because it was the very dwelling place of God. Within it was the Holy of Holies, and there was the Ark of the Covenant. The temple was the destination point of pilgrimage, and it was the place where the sacrificial offerings could be made. At the temple, one was in the very presence of God. It was the place of encounter with God. But Jesus in his coming in the flesh and in the incarnation, in his passion, his death and resurrection, he changes all of this. Because in his life, he transfers the place of sacrifice. He transfers the place of encounter with God from a physical temple to the temple of his very body. When he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up, this is what he is talking about. For the writer of the gospel tells us Jesus is talking about the temple of his body. Jesus says that no longer is this physical temple in Jerusalem the only place where one can encounter God. He says, now I am the presence of God. I am the place of encounter 
with the living God. And I think for us, this has two very important implications for our lives as disciples. The first is to simply remember that Jesus is the revelation of God. He is the place that we can encounter our God. As we seek out the Lord in our Lenten season, as we strive to return to God with all our heart, we are simply invited to turn to Jesus. Jesus who is the new temple, Jesus who is the place of encounter with God, Jesus who is the presence of God. And simply put, if we want to know God, then we just have to know Jesus. And we come to know Jesus, as we do in any relationship, simply by getting to know Him, by spending time with Him in prayer, by listening to Him in sacred scripture, by being nourished by Him, by His body and blood, by meditating on His cross, and seeing God's power and wisdom that can take our own pain and suffering and transform it into new life. In turning to Jesus, we are able to make our own pilgrimage to the temple because we have the sacrifice of Jesus that was made once and for all. And in that, we encounter the living God. We are invited to turn to Jesus, to come to know the presence of God in our midst, in the very person of Jesus. Let's pray that each of us might turn to Jesus during the season of Lent, so that we might know our God more fully, we might experience God's grace in our lives. So as we continue to reflect on the temple of Jesus' body, the second thing I think we have to remember is that we, too, are the body of Christ. And so just as Jesus him, himself is a, is a place of encounter of God, we, as the body of Christ, we are also meant to become the dwelling place of God. We, the Christian community, are called to be the place, to be a temple where others can also encounter God. We, each of us individually and all of us gathered together as a community, we are invited to become a new temple. We are invited to become a new place where the presence of God can be experienced by all. And I think we do this, first of all, by taking a hint from our gospel. We do this by cleansing our own selves, just as Jesus cleansed the temple. By driving out those things that get in the way of being more and more like Him. By getting rid of those things that really hinder us from experiencing God more fully in our lives. Maybe it's an invitation to get rid of greed or jealousy or selfishness. Maybe it's about getting rid of some hatred or prejudice or some unrighteous anger. Whatever it might be that we need to get rid of, we are invited during this Lenten season to do a little bit of spring cleaning with our lives, to really repent, to convert, to, to get rid of those things that get in the way so that we might make room in our hearts so that God might fill it more fully. To get rid of those things that hinder our relationship with God so that we might be filled more fully with the presence of God. I think we also become this new temple of God's presence also in how we treat others. That first reading gives us the Ten Commandments. And I think it's very interesting that the first three are about our relationship with God, and they are so very important. But then the next seven are about our relationship with each other. We are given seven ways in which we are, act, we are to act toward others. 
We are invited to respect others and to pr promote life for all. We are invited to be faithful and a giving person. We are invited to be grateful what God has given to us. We are invited to live in truthfulness, to act with mercy and compassion, with patience and kindness, really to love all of our neighbors, to love all of our brothers and sisters, and truly all are our brothers and sisters. When we do this, when we choose to be in right relationship with others, when we true choose to treat others as God asks us to treat them, then I think we show forth the presence of Christ to others. We make Jesus known to others by our words, by our actions. We really become the presence of Christ for others by our very lives. As each and every one of us works more and more at these things, we together as the body of Christ are built more fully into the dwelling place of God. And we re really transform not only ourselves, but we do transform our world more and more into that new temple that is the dwelling place of God that shows forth the presence of God. Jesus in our gospel today says that he is the new temple. He is the place where we can encounter our living God. But also each one of us, all of us gathered together as the body of Christ, we too are called to become new temples where the presence of God dwells in our midst. During this holy season of Lent, let's turn to Jesus and come to know God more fully. Let's clear out the temple of our hearts so that our lives can show forth the presence of God more fully. Let's live in such a way that others see God in their midst. It doesn't have to take us 46 years. It doesn't have to take us 144 years because the invitation is to let it happen right now. Let's all of us come into the dwelling place of God. Let's encounter the God who gives us life. Let's come and know God's presence in our lives more fully. The presence of God that is full of mercy, that is full of compassion, that is full of love. Let's experience our God in our own lives, and let's be instruments of that presence in all that we do. And so now I invite Father Satish forward uh, for part two. I was supposed to wear my microphone, so I got my mask on. So when you know that I've asked <coughs> our celebrants to just keep it a little shorter than usual, and when um, I'm intervening at a point uh, in the homily, you'd know that this is something very important. Uh, and don't worry, I'm not leaving. Uh, neither my priesthood are going to India or anything of that sort. But this is about uh, this ministry that's developing in our parish. Uh, the ministry to the Spanish-speaking people. And um, as you know, IC Parish has begun to offer full-fledged parish ministry in Spanish. Now, when I initially envisioned this, my plan was to begin slow and to serve the families just in our, the children who are in our school and their families and offer this mass for them. I had said, maybe we'll do one mass per month. But as, we, as it came to be, we have had to adopt a much faster pace. Someone called it a neck-breaking pace, and I kind of agree. There are reasons for this. For a little while now, Hispanic ministry in Dayton has been in a crisis. 
I do not wish to go into details, but the lack of priests who can speak Spanish or minister to the Spanish-speaking people is just one of them. Whereas, whereas I was ready to make humble beginnings, along with consulting our parish leaders, particularly the parish council, in ministering to the Hispanic people, there was a sense of urgency from the archdiocese to address the crisis and offer Hispanic ministry at a place where they feel welcome and where they could belong. Moreover, we have a huge facility and the space to welcome more people into our parish. So I consider it our moral task to welcome a people who otherwise were feeling like sheep without a shepherd. When I first announced the beginning of a weekly mass and consulted with the parish pastoral council, there has only been expressions of support. However, the speed at which this ministry is growing has taken me by surprise, even me by surprise. Last Saturday, there were double the number of people we had for the very first mass that we had after Ash Wednesday. Beginning a culturally and linguistically diverse ministry is a very delicate task. Growing at such a pace, even more delicate. Staffing, mass schedules, liturgical and pastoral ministries must all be in place before we can address this ministry. As pastor, this is my promise, that sensitive to the needs of the existing parish community, which is all of you, and the needs of the Hispanic community, I will make sure that one side does not feel pushed aside or the other side feel second class. I hope you trust my leadership on this issue. But that does bring one issue to the fore. The lack of priests to minister to Hispanic populations has made it necessary to look at our Holy Week schedule creatively. There are some changes to the original schedule that was published in the bulletin or perhaps on the website as well. For Holy Thursday, Good Friday and Easter Vigil, instead of having two separate celebrations for each of the two language groups, for the first time in the history of our parish, we are hoping to have bilingual celebrations. And this is where it affects each one of us the most. Worship aids and screens will help us to make sure that no part of the Mass goes untranslated. And the reason I'm sharing with you after the homily today is because I do not want it to come as a surprise for you when you come for those Holy Week liturgies to say, oh, we didn't know this. And so these services, the traditional Holy Thursday 7 p.m. Mass, the 12 noon Good Friday service, the 2.30 p.m. Good Friday Way of the Cross, and the 8.45 Easter Vigil services will be bilingual. On Easter Day, there will be Mass in Spanish at 9 a.m., Mass in English at 11 a.m., and Mass in English again at 6 p.m. Now, part of the reason why we are having bilingual is for me to do a Holy Week service, or Holy Thursday service, first in English and then repeat it in Spanish. Uh, it's just simply, I think, superfluous and really difficult for me as well. For the lack of Spanish-speaking priests, I will be celebrating all these Masses. Now, I'm very sensitive to the reality that I must also include St. Helen Parish in all of these plans because I'm also the pastor there. In some way, I need to minister to the needs of that community as well without them feeling left out. And thanks to the Marinist priests, Father Bob Jones is here today, Father Jim Fitz was here yesterday, and Father Tony Geraci, the Holy Week schedule at St. Helen Parish will remain intact for the moment. There are no changes to that. I'm sensitive to that as well. Folks, in this very time, I see parish can be a witness to unity, peace, reconciliation at a time where there is much need for it in our nation and, in fact, in the world. Pope Francis is on a trip to Iraq right now, and he's trying to reconcile two religious traditions that have been in odds for centuries. And he's trying to make sure that the gospel can be preached in such a way that peoples can come together. His big message, ever since he took over, and especially in the last few years, is fraternity. We are fraternal brothers and sisters, not just as people of the same religion, but different, but simply as human beings. I believe that the IC parish can be prophetic in the way we embrace one another and in the way we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our midst. I'm convinced of one thing. 
and the time is ripe, and the time is now. And yes, one more thing, I believe God is leading us during this time. I will be at the back of church after mass, and I would like to hear from you both your hopes and your fears, your support or lack of it. I believe it is honest conversations that will take us forward and lead the path to the future. Thank you, everybody.